everybody. Welcome to Sunday School class this morning. Reach down and grab a hymnal. Stand, if you would, please, to page number 278. Page number 278 at Calvary. second by God's word at last my sin I learned then I trembled at the law I spurned till my guilt is so important in turn to Calvary mercy there was great and grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burden so found number 377 page 377 faith is the victory page 377 encamped along the hills of mighty christian soldiers rise and press the battle and shall veil the glory against the foe in veils below let all our strength be heard faith is the victory
Good morning. morning. Romans chapter 8. Chapter 8, we skipped a chapter. Yeah, I don't like that chapter, so we're just going to skip it. (laughs) Isn't that what we do? We read the things we want to read and look at the things we like to look at. We'll remember the scripture that fits more our life and our victories, and and we like to quote those. So we'll just skip chapter 7. That's all hard stuff. No, what I want to do is, uh, I think there's a couple verses in chapter 8 that uh, really kind of wraps up the whole reason behind Romans 6 and 7. And so sometimes it helps if you know how the story is going to end, that as, as you read through it, you know the ending and everything seems to make more sense because you know the purpose. And that's, that's kind of the approach we're going to take this morning a little bit. <clears throat> I was in uh, California this last week made it back, got in there and out alive, safely, and uh, wasn't brainwashed or anything. But uh, I did learn some things. Uh, We went down there on a a business survey looking to uh, move into California with our business a little bit maybe, and and, uh, so uh, we, we have a relationship with another company down there, and so we spent a few days looking around, and it's an ag company. And uh, and so one of the things that I learned is, I don't know if you've noticed it around here, but driving up and down the highway every once in a while, you get somebody in the left-hand lane that won't move. No. We call those at work left-lane vigilantes. And, uh, oh, they're miserable, terrible. I mean, you just makes you think bad things, right? And there's actually laws against perpetually driving in the left lane. So, uh, and we always blame that on California drivers, don't we? Oh, it must be from California. Anyway, so I go down there, and we're driving down the interstate, down uh, Interstate 5, and and, uh, I'm in the left lane, (laughs) but every car is in the left lane, every car, and all the trucks are in the right lane, and that's how they drive. And if you want to pass a car, you got to wait for there's a gap in the trucks, and you move out of the left lane into the right lane, and you pass, and you get back in line with all the cars that are in the left lane. Go figure. So, you know, people come up to Idaho, and they, I'm supposed to drive in the left lane. So, you know, they're driving in the left lane. And uh, that, that's just how they drive down there. It's crazy. And uh, I acclimated to that. I just got in the left lane with everybody else, and, and away we went. So... When in Rome, do as Romans do, right? (laughs) California. But you know, another thing about California, we we are, uh, well, we just think a bunch of liberal socialists down there. But if you look at the statistics, 40% of the people in California still vote conservative Republican. There's, there's, that's a lot of people. I mean, you think about all the population of California, whatever it is, 30, 40, 50 million. Uh, 40% of them are Republican. There's more Republicans in California than there are in Idaho, right? Way more. It's just that they're the minority. So we go down there when when we're surveying this business, and it's an agricultural business. And so we start in uh, Sacramento and work our way right down Central Valley to uh, Modesto, Stockton, Merced, all the way down to Fresno. And it's tons of people. Cities, you know, are huge, and there's just industry everywhere, and cars and people. It's it's just crazy. But you get you get one mile out of Fresno, and it's acre upon acre upon acre, mile upon mile upon mile of ag, vineyards, orchards, strawberries, tomatoes, all these different almonds, all kind of nut crops, um, just mile upon mile and those are the people that I do business with the farmers down there and you know you talk to them they are just like us they, they're worried about water they're worried about labor they're worried about making a living 
and they work really hard all year long hoping to get a good price on whatever they've grown, not knowing what it's going to be. They just hope. And, uh, you know, that's the, that's the miracle about farming is all the hard work and effort. You know what it's like to grow a garden. You imagine your livelihood based on the success of that garden and all the work that goes into that all year long to produce that crop and you just, you just take such careful care of it with the weeds and the insects and the disease. And then uh, at the end, selling it at the market for whatever the market will give you. And you don't know that. I, I tell you, these, these guys that farm, it's, you know, I think that's, if, if you look at what God gave Adam to do from the very beginning, he said, I put you on this earth and into this garden to tend it. That's, tending is a big, is a different word that we don't use today, but it means work. And uh, that's, that's what it is. And I tell you what, that, that work of agriculture is a life of faith. And uh, it's tremendous faith. My faith lasts about every other week when the paycheck comes. If the paycheck quit coming, I'd lose my faith real quick in the company. And I'd be out of there and find something else, right? Yep. That's where we live. Our faith to faith is paycheck to paycheck. But a farmer... It's year after year after year, and it's just their life. And, and I'm, I'm glad to be involved in that business. I know several of you are in a similar way, whether you work utilities or water or whatever it might be. You get a glimpse of what it's like to be in production ag. And, and I appreciate that I can enjoy it from the distance that I do, really. All right. Romans chapter 8, let's read a few verses here. California. You know, the first thing those farmers asked me when I went down there, they said, they looked at me like I had lost my mind. Why do you want to come to California? That's them asking me, you know, why do you want to be down here? And, and as a businessman in ag, the answer is simple. There's more business in ag transacted in the Central Valley of California than there is in the rest of the United States combined. They farm all year long. We don't. We farm this little gap called spring and summer. And so it produces a tremendous economy in ag. And that's, that's really our interest. All right. <clears throat> Mrs. H is home today. And uh, we're watching we... She's watching five of the grandkids that, from Lee and Sam that live up in Lewiston. They're over vacationing in Hawaii. And so Renee offered to watch their little ones, little bitty things. And they're all sick with the cough and the snotty noses and the runny eyes. And she says, I think I'll just stay home with them today. <clears throat> Romans 8, and uh, starting in verse number 2. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. You know, and I think that those... Um, Three verses right there are a tremendous summary of why Paul goes to such great length through 5, 6, 7, and 8 to explain this whole business we've been talking about being crucified with Christ and that, that we are dead to sin and, and alive unto God. And, and Paul uh, uh, writes a, a great narrative earlier on in the book about why that's needed and then the mechanics of how that happens in chapter 6, but but chapter 8 and these few verses summarize all that activity and all that event for one purpose. And, in, and that is that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, right? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And, and it's a great summary. Um, so so just, just uh, looking at that, I want to talk a little bit about God's purpose and his plan. 
and, and give you some points. I'm going to talk in points today, like point A, B, C, and D, and some of you like that. You know, I, you, you like to hear a message that's A, B, C, one, two, three, and you can write it down, and you know, it's, it's nice and organized. And then sometimes I just get up here and ramble on about a general topic, and that's frustrating because is he on point one or point two, and what's the sub point? And there is no point. It's just talk, you know? And that's frustrating for some, and, and I can do both. Um, it's kind of like hunting for white tail or mule deer. The white tail will follow a trail, and you can count on that trail, and you can set your deer stand up by that trail because that's the trail they're going to use. Muleys, they just wander all over the place, and it's kind of frustrating. You've got to shoot them from a long distance because they're different. Well, this is sort of like that, but today it's points. And I'll do my best to stay on point. I might wander off, you know, a little bit. But Anyway, these verses here in Romans 8, 2 through 4, starts out with uh, explaining our situation and how God finds us. Uh, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Sin and death is, is the, and the law of sin and death is where God finds us. That's how we, uh, we started under Adam, and that's how every one of us comes into this world under that law of sin and death. And what is that law? That sin leads to death, and that you really don't have any other option. As hard as you might try, as, as hard as you might uh, uh, be faithful to a religion, I don't care what it is. Uh, there's there's uh, people all over the planet that are just really faithful to their religion, thinking that somehow that's going to be and, and produce some kind of deliverance from the same law that they're under that I am, this law of sin and death. And, and they might get a, a, a reprieve from it in, 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 in a feeling of some sort, but it's not based on fact and it's not based on a promise from God. And, and so they're still under that law of sin and death. That's how God finds us. <clears throat> sin and death are um, formidable foes or enemies, aren't they? They win every time. Outside of Jesus Christ, outside of God's intervention, sin and death are 10 for 10. I mean, they just win every time, no matter how hard we try. That's how he finds us. He finds us, it says here, uh, in the flesh. That's also a problem. The, the, the flesh is fertile ground for sin and death. And those three all get along really good. They all agree, even though the, the body, if it knew what the end was, might argue a little bit, but the flesh is fertile ground for sin and eventually death. It's corrupt. That's how God finds us. That is a problem. Both of those, sin and death, are exposed quite well in Romans 1 through 5. And we've been through that. You all know those chapters and those verses. We also see that uh, even though that's our situation, that's how God finds us, there is an alternative, and that alternative is life. The, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. The spirit of life. Isn't that wonderful how the King James Bible describes that alternative to sin and death? is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It says it's an alternative. It's made me free from the law of sin and death. It's not this, that says this law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is not added to the law of sin and death. Like they're, they're, uh, they travel both with me. It's one or the other. Right? That's a principle that is played out all through the Bible when you're dealing with God and His uh, motives, His solutions, His, uh, His thoughts. 
it's not to commingle sin and death with the spirit of life. It's either one or the other. And, uh, and, and that's a good thing, right? We need to keep that in mind. <clears throat> that, that one law makes us free. It's not a helper over sin and death. It frees us from sin and death. And if the Son make you free, you shall be free indeed. Yeah. Secondly, a part of, uh, in addition to that, Life is our purpose, not death. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus, based on those verses, is God's purpose. It's part of his purpose, to bring life. It's not about death. You know, and so much of religious teaching today is about dying to this and dying to that. And Christianity isn't about dying, it's about living. The Christian life is about living. It's, it's, it's maybe a process through death, but the end point is so that we might live unto God. Life is our purpose, not death. It's God's purpose. We started out with free access to what? The tree of life. Stay away from the knowledge of good and evil. Life is what it's about. Just as it is with our children. Think about that. Your children might grow up thinking, Mom and Dad, you just want me to do all the check marks, you know, and fill, uh, do everything you say and obey the, all the, the rules and regulations. Have you ever heard that from your kids? It's just about rules and regulations with you. Be home by this time and don't stay out past that and do this and do that and checklist, checklist, checklist. They have that in mind, but you know as a parent, that's not what it's about. It's about staying away from certain things so that you might enjoy life. You know for your kids, you want them to have an industrious, pleasant, safe, enjoyable, joyous life. Not trouble and trial, one after another. <laughs> So that's why we tell our kids, don't hang around with that guy. That's going to lead to trouble, right? Um, come home by a certain time because nothing good happens after midnight. Nothing good happens after midnight. Don't drink even this because that leads to this. Don't smoke this because that leads to this. And, and so much of that principle is played out in the scripture. You know, it's, it's God's intent isn't for us to just obey the law so that there's a checklist and say, oh, I got him to obey the law. It's so that we might have life and have it what? Abundantly. Just like we feel for our kids. We want them to have life and abundantly. We cannot do it for them. We want them to get there on their own, and so we put up these bumpers, you know. But it's about life. That's the alternative to sin and death. The Bible talks about God being angry with sin because it what? It's not necessarily the sin, but it's what it leads to. What does it lead to? It leads to death. And God is all about life. He's not about death. And in fact, he's so much about life that he says, I can give you what? Life eternal. Or death eternal. It's up to you, but he says, I'll do everything in my power to enable you to get to life eternal. It's about life. He's angry with sin because it leads to death. For the same reason that we get angry with our kids when they start going off the path. Because we know where it leads. And, and we don't have to use our imagination. All we do have to do is read the obituaries and read the newspaper. And we know where that kind of activity leads. And we're not upset with our kids because of the behavior itself, but what it leads to or what it could. So what do you prefer? 
a life apart from sin and death? Do you prefer that? Do you, do you prefer the law of sin and death and staying there? Or do you prefer, or would you prefer, the spirit of life through Christ Jesus? One or the other. But it's not a combination of both. You don't have to live with a portion of one and a portion of the other. You can be free from one to enjoy the other. Or in bondage to one and secluded from the other. The alternative to life or the alternative to sin and death is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So God's purpose and plan is life. It's righteousness. Secondly, in these verses we see the law. In verse number 3 it says, For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns him in sin in the flesh. So we see in, in this summary verses, we see the law. What, what is the law and what's it for? Is that God's purpose? Well, it's not his purpose. It never was his purpose. But the law is a clear reflection of what God desires for us. I mean, he could list numerous laws out there saying do this and don't do that. And it's just simply a reflection of his character and his nature and what he wants for us. That's why it's there. What does the, what does the New Testament call the law? Our schoolmaster. And what do you do if you've got a schoolmaster? You learn about things. It's there for our teaching. It's there for our learning. It's there for our instructions to get us to a point that reflects what God wants in our life. Look how it says, but what the law could not do. And I thought about that and I thought, it's God's intent to do something. He, wanted, he has to do something. He's, he's left with us that are, that are in bondage to this law of sin and death. And so he wanted to do some things to change that. He introduced the law to do something. And we find that it could not do what he intended. Not because of any weakness on his part, but because of a weakness on our part. Did God learn something about us or did this surprise him that, oh, I tried that, but it didn't work? I think he knew that. And, and looking at the solution today and the results of that solution, we look back and say, it was probably part of his plan all along. And it was, wasn't it? What the law could not do, God wanted it to do something, but it could not because of uh, a weakness on our, our part. And that weakness is the flesh. It's the flesh. The Bible describes it as the flesh with its affections and lusts. It had different things in mind for what God had in mind. It doesn't have righteousness in mind. It just has fulfillment in mind. And, and where that becomes a problem is when those, those affections and lusts become extreme and perverted there's nothing wrong with being hungry there's nothing wrong with sexual relationship between a man and a woman if they're married that's God's perfect plan when we pervert them when we take them to the extreme is and that's flesh let loose right and that leads to death The law had little impact on the flesh itself. All right, so what's God's solution? It's there in, in, in verse number 3 in chapter 8. It says, <clears throat> God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh. God's solutions. Why was Jesus' death a solution? It says He sent His own Son. Nobody else could do. Who else did he send? Well, he sent Moses. Moses couldn't get it done. Noah couldn't get it done. Elijah couldn't get it done. David couldn't get it done. 
Nobody could get it done. Joseph couldn't get it done. Daniel, Gideon, and all the ones that are listed in the, in the, in the hall book of faith in chapter 11 of Hebrews, couldn't get it done. He sent his own son, the only one that could do it. In the likeness of sinful flesh. But he was different, wasn't he? He looked like us. But there was something about him that was different. But he came for a purpose and, and we often look at him and say, well, he's our example that in the flesh you can live a perfect life. I don't think that was the purpose. Because in this, in this filthy thing, we cannot live a perfect life. We can't. So he wasn't there for our example like the Mormons say. Oh, he's just our example that we can do it. He came in a body of flesh to die and and crucify this fleshly body crucify sin in this body like it says he came in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh how did he do that by dying on that cross that's how and being crucified and remember the only thing that died on that cross was not his spirit or his soul it was his flesh it was that body that's the purpose there. That's why it had to be Jesus Christ, and that's why he went to the cross, to condemn sin in the flesh. It's interesting how God, and we've said this before, how God looks at death as the answer to our problem. He's just an extreme God, isn't he? He doesn't, he doesn't go just part way with anything. Let's just go all the way. Let's deal with all the problems, not just your one little problem, because as many people that are in here this morning, you all have your individual problems, whether it's pride or greed or lying or lust or whatever it might be. It's all listed there in the book. We have those problems, but the solution to all of them isn't that God's going to take his time and deal with each one of you individually with your little issue. He says, I'll just go ahead and take care of all this through death. And we'll start over with this law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Death is the answer to our problem. That's hard for us to grasp. We so love just going up to the altar and praying our little problem, saying, God, please help me with this one thing, you know. I struggle with my finances. I struggle with uh, a critical spirit or whatever it might be. We, we like to do that. He says, I, I fixed all that on the cross. <clears throat> As I, I was thinking about that this morning, why did he have to do it through Jesus Christ? You ever think about that? Crucifixion, we can all come to the solution or come to the conclusion that death is the answer. And that crucifixion is, is a good way to die. I mean, you're going to die. That's a man's way to die. Whew. If that's the solution, then why did Jesus Christ have to go through it, not us? Well, think of the alternative. If that's the solution and Jesus didn't do it, who's going to do it? Everybody in here individually individually from the beginning of time until today the solution for you being delivered from this flesh is you dying on the cross and God resurrecting you up out of the grave so that you can walk in newness of life how many in here want to go through that and would go through that to live a righteous life what no hands that's gruesome we don't want to do that. He did that. The alternative to Jesus Christ dying on that cross is you dying on the cross, just like he did, and being resurrected. He's not going to do that individually for all of us, for everyone, man, woman, boy, and girl that's born onto this earth until he comes back. He's not going to do that. What's another way that he could do that? 
he could send his son, who was the perfect um, substitute, the perfect sacrifice, clean and unblemished, he could die on the cross and we can be baptized into him so that Jesus Christ experience then becomes our experience. You know, that's a principle that exists in the Bible. It's called vicarious. You know what that word means? It's like when uh, dads raise their sons and they live their life vicariously through their son. Son, I want you to be a football star. Son, I want you to drive fast cars. Son, I want you to do this, that, and the other. Why? Because maybe dad wants to live vicariously through their son. Guilty, right? You're going to go to college. You're going to get a great degree. You're going to make lots of money. Who are we thinking about there? The son or me? You know what I'm talking about. But Jesus Christ died on that cross and gave himself for us. And he did something vicariously for us. And he died on that cross for us. You know, there's two other verses in the Bible that support that principle. And that's that he that knew no sin, what? Became sin for us. That we might be the what? The righteousness of God in him. That's, we became the righteousness of God vicariously through what Jesus Christ did. There's another verse in, uh, I think it's 1st or 2nd Corinthians, where it says, He that was rich became poor, that we through his poverty might become rich. That's also a vicarious position where... In order for you to be rich, I'm going to become poor. And that will elevate you to that position of wealth. And, and through that crucifixion, uh, you might be elevated to that position of life. So we either had to die individually ourselves or Christ could die for us. He took our place in both cases to elevate us to life, to riches, and righteousness. So why couldn't God just do that to us? Why must Christ die or endure poverty in order for us to be free from both? He could have just done that to us and said, you're free. We'll talk about that a little later. Romans 8, 4, God's purpose. So, back to our points. Point number one was God's purpose and plan. Point two was the law. Point three was God's solution. Point four, now we're going to look at God's purpose. 8, 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. It's the life of righteousness that God wants us to live. That's what he wants us to live, this life of righteousness. There's no getting around that. But not through or by works or effort on our part. But by something else. Something that sets us apart from everybody else on the planet. Because if his goal is to get us to live by righteousness, and maybe that's the goal of every religion that's out there, and we watch people try to live that life of righteousness on their own accord, in the flesh, by their own works and their bo- by their own efforts, then we as Christians, if that's how it's done, we are no different than the Muslims or the Buddhists or the Mormons or anybody else out there. You just pick one. Doesn't make any difference. We're just like them. If, it's, if that's how it's done, by obeying principles and following rules and regulations and just trying really hard and pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, what is that not? It's not by faith. And if it's not by faith, then it's by works. And if it's by works, then it's not by faith. And who gets the glory when it's by works? You do. Who gets the glory if it's by faith? He does. 
God's purpose, that we walk and live this life of righteousness that God wants us to live through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 1 and, and verses 14 and 16, I won't have you turn there, but it says, Be ye holy as he is holy, as I am holy. That's what God wants. He, he was direct and clear in that point. Be holy. You cannot get away from those verses. He's not talking metaphorically. He's not trying to give it your best effort. He says, be holy as I am holy. In uh, 1 John chapter 2, it says, uh, walk as he walked. You can make a note and follow those verses. He says, walk as he walked. Now, there's a challenge. There's a throwdown if you want one. Walk as he did. In 1 John 2, 1, it says, uh, I write these things unto you, little children, that what? You sin not. We remember the next part of that verse, don't we? But if any man sin, he have an advocate with the Father. And we can run to that. We, we know that verse verbatim for that reason. But it didn't start out that way. It started out saying, ye sin not. Now, God doesn't give you that command or that instruction without a way to do that. And that's what we've been talking about the last several weeks is the way to do that. So, Romans 8, 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. That's what this is all about. It's about life. It's about walking free from those things that we were in bondage to. This, this law of sin and death. We are free from that by the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and being baptized into that. It's quite clear. So, after all these weeks, what have we learned? Going back to Romans 6. We've learned that uh, God's expectation, like it says in Romans 5.21, that grace should reign through righteousness unto eternal life. We learn from Romans 6.2 that we are not to continue in sin, but not that we should continue, but how should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? There's a pretty high bar set. There's a high expectation. So we've learned, one, God's expectation. Two, we learned the solution was death to the flesh and that Christ took our place in that death, like it says in, in 6 and verse number 10. For, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Talking about the Lord himself. The solution was death. Thirdly, we learned that we are baptized into Christ and his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his new life. And uh, verse number three, it says, we, uh, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. There's the purpose again, walking in newness of life. We are baptized into Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. It says that again in Colossians chapter 2. Fourthly, we too, we learn that we too are dead indeed unto sin. Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 3 says, ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. So we learn, fourthly, that we too are dead indeed unto sin. The fifth thing we learned is that we are freed from sin through this death. Romans 6, 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants unto God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So we've learned that we are not only dead with him, but that death frees us from sin. 
The sixth thing we've learned is that being made free, we are to live unto God. Romans 6, 4 talks about this newness of life. Romans 6, 8 says that we uh, eventually want to, we, that we are raised again to live with Him and walk with Him. Romans 6, 10 talks about liveth, living unto God. Romans 6, 13 tells us that we are alive from the dead. And Romans 6, 11 or 18 says that we are to be servants of righteousness. And again, 6.22 says that we are, the end is everlasting life. Being made free, we are to live unto God. Turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 You know, an hour seems like a long time to teach, but I find myself... Uh, not getting far enough. Romans, or uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse number 9. The seventh thing that we learn is that this is not a process over time where you die little by little every day. This is available immediately. Chapter 6, verse number 9. Oops, I lost my spot there. 1 Corinthians 6. It says in verse number 9 of chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Does that sound like a process to you? It doesn't to me. He's looking at a group of, of young Christians in this Corinthian church, and he lists a lot of bad things there, and he says boldly, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified by Jesus Christ and what he did for us and to us. We can claim that promise today. It's there. It's quite clear in the Bible. So, that's what we've learned. How is it then, you say, that we are dead but not dead? How can we be alive unto God but seem not to be? How can we, where it says we're free from sin but we continue in sin daily, how can we stop sinning and never sin again? You say, that's preposterous. Might I offer that we serve a God of the preposterous? Is there anything too hard for God? <laughs> he's a preposterous God. I think of what he, He's done for me, and it's quite preposterous. I, I think about the promises that He's given me, and it's out of this world. Is there anything too hard for God? I, I understand there's, too, there's things that are too hard for us to understand, or for us to comprehend, or for us to believe, in, for that matter. But it doesn't limit God and His promises to us, does it? He's done some miraculous things. I don't know if you've read your Bible, but there's some crazy stuff in there that He's done. So how is it? The key that unlocks the door is faith. All these things that you say in your mind that Brother Dave has been teaching over the last several weeks, trying really hard to convince you and to tell you biblically that this promise of being dead to sin and that the flesh is no longer a factor and that we are, are free to live unto righteousness and unto God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and, and we died with Him, we were buried with Him, we live unto God today because of what He did. We can walk free from sin. Do you get the impression that we are to be in bondage the rest of our life? After all that we've covered, the key to unlocking that is faith. 
It has always been about faith, and it always will be about faith. Romans 6, um, 17, is, is, it gives us a, a, just a glimpse into that, where it says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. See, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done. It's, it's by faith that we believe what God said to be true. Even though it doesn't seem to be, it doesn't matter. That's why Abraham is our perfect example. Perfect example. He believed something so preposterous, but he did it anyway, and it put a smile on God's face. A hundred-year-old man is a father of a great nation with my wife's 90 and she's going to conceive? I know what your ladies are thinking. That ain't happening. It's not even going to get close to happening. But he believed it. That's the key to unlocking these promises that we've been covering. Not only these promises, but these truths that are already true. If you're saved, it's a truth that's already available to you in your life. Amen. What keeps you from living it? Faith. You have to believe, like it says, from the heart. That form of doctrine, doctrine, doctrine that was delivered unto you. That's where the freedom lies. Next week, we're going to talk about faith and what it is and what it isn't. And why it's so important. Why faith is what we struggle with. But why it puts such a gigantic smile on God's face. We're going to talk about that next week. But let me finish up with a word of testimony. I think I told you last week, and mentioned it briefly, that... Uh, I, I didn't start out <laughs> very religious. I was raised in the bowling alleys with drinking and smoking and carousing. That's, that's where I was raised. No religion. Whatever we went to church, Dad would drag us down to the Catholic church and we would do our thing. And, and uh, I, I remember even the uh, priest gave the mass in Latin. And uh, that really helped. So this little boy sat there and looked around at all the caricatures and the fixtures and the statues and the idols. And uh, God began to sow something in my brain uh, that played out many, many years later. But by the time I was 12, I had already adapted to a, a life of promiscuity. And uh, you know that long list of things we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? Half of those was me, even at a young age. So my mom and dad divorced when I was about 10 or 11, and, uh, which was no big deal to me, I guess. You know, it was hell by the acre. That's our life. And uh, he remarried a gal that was raised in Wisconsin that uh, had a foundation coming in out of the, uh, the Dutch Reformed Church. Kind of a legalistic, Calvinistic, but they believed the Bible. And she was raised under the Bible. And she told my dad, I'll marry you, but you quit smoking, you quit drinking, and you quit cussing, and I'll marry you. My dad said, okay. As a lost man, he quit all those things. Don't tell me you quit those things when you got saved. My dad did it lost. Mostly. <laughs> he still cussed when it got bad. But I remember the first time my stepmother gave me a spanking. I think I was 11 or 12, I don't know. And uh, it was because of my foul mouth. And she tried to give me a spanking with her hand, and I thought, uh, I done graduated from this by the time I was three. And you had to use an implement to get my attention. And uh, so anyway, she was quite upset. 
And that night, Dad came home and he pulled me aside. He said, you had, a, you had some problems today. And I said, yeah, this is what happened. He said, and all he said was to me was, son, we can't talk like that no more. Okay. Didn't give me a reason necessarily. Just said, you can't talk like that no more. So I learned how and when to talk like that, right? You can control it. I was just a sweet little child and when she was around, but a heathen hellion when she wasn't. And I grew up like that. And uh, we moved back to Wisconsin, started attending this, this little church, and, and I heard for the first time a gospel message from either my Sunday school pr- uh, teacher or a visiting preacher. And uh, we were living at Grandpa's place in this uh, two, two-story brick house with no plumbing. We had an outdoor toilet, and uh, it was wonderful life for a little boy living on the farm. And I, I remember going up to, into my bedroom that night, and laying there contemplating my sinful life and remembering what the preacher had said about um, receiving Jesus Christ into your heart for forgiveness. And I remember that night like it was last night. And I laid there and I swore there was two entities in that room, the devil and the Lord himself. And I knew in my heart of heart I was going to follow one or the other. And I made a choice that night, a conscious decision, and I prayed and I asked the Lord into my heart as a young boy that I don't, I don't know what's ahead, but I know what was behind. And because of that, I know where I'm headed. And... Uh, you know, I just did what they told me to do. I, I, I asked the Lord Jesus into my heart, just as sincere as I possibly could. And uh, I'll never forget that. that. That was a D mark in my life. It, things from that point on going forward were different. But because of that, those first years, that life of promiscuity and alcohol and drugs and smoking and all that stuff and and uh, pornography and all that. It was, our life was filled with that stuff. It, it didn't leave me right away. And I carried that with me for a long, long time. Until, uh, you know, married and moving on with life and, and uh, going to church and I recognized the value of the Bible and I appreciated it. But I, I continued to struggle with sin. I really did. Um, I was addicted to some things. You say, what things? Read that list. Pick one. <laughs> Pick one. I was addicted. I couldn't quit. As much as I wanted to, as many times as I went up to that altar and begged God, take it from me. Do whatever. Save me again. I don't know. Whatever. I hated it. Never had any solution or answers. Until one day, my wife was listening to a preacher And I didn't want to listen to him because he talked about living a holy life. And I knew I couldn't do that. So I didn't want to listen to him. But he he had some child training things that she was listening to, raising those kids and homeschooling and all that. And I would listen to him in the background, you know, and I thought, I ain't listening to that guy. He, He holds a high bar. But eventually I started listening to him and he brought this message that I'm trying to bring to you, that there is freedom in Jesus Christ. And I began to listen and listen and listen, and he did it right out of the King James Bible. And one day, I was driving down the road thinking about all this and listening to a podcast of his, and he said, it, it's just like when you go and take your car to the mechanic and you say you want this one thing fixed. And the mechanic takes that car out back and he puts it in the cruncher and he smashes it down to the size of a suitcase and brings it back to you and says, here, I fixed your car. And you have a fit because, well, I just wanted, no, he says, forget that old car. Why don't you just ride with me? Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no fixing Adam. That is right. That's good, brother. Amen. And I'll tell you, I, I teach this with passion because that thing that I was addicted to for 40 years When I heard that message and I believed it in my heart, it was like light bulb. I've been trying to fix Adam when all the time God was trying to tell me, I fixed him. I killed him on the cross. Believe it 
and walk free from sin. I'm telling you, those things that were an addiction to me, that moment that I heard that message and believed it out of the Bible, it left me. The, the, uh, the affections and lust left me. And I walked free from those things that I was addicted to for all those years. So it's, it's not a hypothetical. It's not just me up here teaching you what's in the Bible. This happened to me. 